Hello, everyone. Welcome to the new tomorrow, accept, adapt, and switch. If anyone thought about the meaning of new tomorrow a few months ago, it would have had an entirely different meaning than what it has today. We are more interconnected than ever with this new reality we were forced into. And to help us understand what it is we have experienced collectively and individually in the past three months, I am pleased to introduce our incredible experts, two individuals who have dedicated their lives to understanding the human psyche. With us today are Professor Yoram Yovel, a highly respected psychiatrist, brain researcher, psychoanalyst, TV presenter, author, and international keynote speaker. Many of you know him from his primetime show, Sichat Nefesh, Heart to Heart Talk, which he hosted for 10 years, an award-winning interview program on Israeli TV where he interviewed politicians, writers, and artists about the relationship between their lives and their work. Yovel is also a best-selling author. His books deal with how science may account for some of the puzzling, seemingly illogical workings of human mind. Brainstorm, published in 2001, and What is Love?, published in 2004. I'm also delighted to introduce Dan Ariely, a James B. Duke professor of psychology and behavioral economics at Duke University. Professor Ariely is a founding member of the Center for Advanced Hindsight, co-creator of the documentary film Dishonesty, The Truth About Lies. Wait, wait, wait. You didn't give it enough pause, please. The Center for Advanced Hindsight. That's a funny name. You need to, you need to stop after that. I'm joking. Go, go ahead. Professor Ariely is a founding member of, a member of the Center for Advanced Hindsight. Okay. Pause, co-creator of the documentary film Dishonesty, The Truth About Lies, and a three-time New York Times best-selling author. His books include Predictability, Irrational, The Upside of Irrationality, The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, Irrationally Yours, and Payoff. And in 2013, Bloomberg recognized Dan as one of the top 50 most influential thinkers. He also has a bi-weekly advice column in the Wall Street Journal called Ask Ariely. Welcome, gentlemen. It's a pleasure having you here with us. Lovely to be here. Likewise. likewise. I'll start with a question that I'm going to direct to both of you. And I'd like to know, let's kind of set the tone. How would you describe what we all just went through and are still going through, some of us, maybe in Israel a little less, both collectively and personally, from a psychological and mental standpoint. Uh, Professor Ariely, let's begin with you. I know you've been studying the ramifications of COVID-19 and conducting quite extensive research. Uh, first of all, thank you. I didn't mean to throw you off. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so maybe as a quick introduction, uh, I'll, I'll just say that uh, I'm a part of a small company that uh, works with the government uh, here in Israel. And uh, during uh, the COVID-19, uh, period, we were involved in many things. We were involved in uh, how to give instructions in a way that people could understand and follow. Um, how do we uh, think about the education school? What do we do with prisoners? What do we do with uh, domestic violence? Um, how do we put money back into the economy? Uh, how do we get mayors to collaborate? So lots, lots of things. But, but if we ask about uh, the psychology, of this event, uh, it's actually a very, very complex event with lots, lots of things going on. Uh, I think there's lots of questions about trust uh, between individuals and the government. Uh, I think there are questions about what's called public good. How do we think and act uh, collectively? And uh, of course, there's the aspect of stress. Um, and then the economy and, and so on. So, so uh, just, just to focus on, on one of them, uh, maybe I'll say something about uh, collective good. Uh, and and there, are, there are other aspects, of course. Um, if you think about something like taxes, uh, taxes are collective good. So um, if 10% of the people don't pay their taxes, that's a bad thing, and we have 10% less tax. In COVID-19, if 10% of the people don't adhere to the instructions and they run around, it's not just 10% less, it can ruin it uh, for everybody. If we try to do some kind of uh, distancing and 10% of the people don't adhere, 
uh, much of the distances is, is useless. Um, and then and if you think about it, what it means is that if we work together as a country, uh, then everybody gets to, to benefit. And if we don't, even a small minority can, can destroy it for everybody. And, and we, started, we started this period with a very high uh, collective action. Not perfect, and we had some challenges with minorities, but uh, we did very well with collective action. Uh, that collective action has stopped. You know, very sadly, if you look at what's happening in the last few days, it's true that uh, the numbers are going, are going down, uh, but, but my fear is that this sense of commitment to the collective good has, has gone down, and, and the commitment to a collective good is things like wearing masks, right, when you do it for other people uh, more, than, more than yourself. And, and I'm very, very proud of the collective uh, action we had early on. It's really kind of amazing and, and heartwarming. Um, I'm, I'm a little worried about the, the reduction over time, and of course it links to uh, trust and, and other things. So that's the beginning comment. So collective action that dwindles once the crisis is over, or at least seems to be over. Um, I think, I think the, the, the dwindling actually started uh, when, when uh, Netanyahu and uh, Rivlin uh, violated uh, social distancing or distancing. So it wasn't uh, the objective reality of where mm -hmm. the distance was. It was about uh, trust. And it was also about uh, some anger about uh, the way the economy was was opening. Interesting, which we saw here in the States as well, when you saw leaders who weren't practicing what different governors and the administration were preaching, that definitely created that sense of distrust. Uh, Yoram, how would you see these three months, what it means, where we're at, summarize the craziness. Yeah, um, so first of all, I think um, um, perfect hindsight is, is indeed always perfect. So I think it's much easier to talk about things from right now. Um, I, I agree with everything that uh, Dan said. I think the, um, uh, the, the question about is, is, is this a trauma and are we traumatized? I would say the answer is yes. I think that all the variables, um, both on a national level here in Israel as well as uh, in the U.S., uh, and the personal responses of most people, what you see on, on, uh, in the media and social networks, you know, yes, we have been traumatized. But I would say that this is this is a special form of trauma, um, something that we have not experienced before. And I think um, fear of the unexpected or concern about the unexpected. Um, can uh, put you off guard um, for a long time and as, as things are changing. So I think for all of us, this has been travel through uncharted territory. Um, and then issues of social cohesiveness and, and trust, as Dan said, uh, play paramount importance in uh, both the adherence to, to um, uh, the government's instructions and in terms of the, the national morale, how, how people respond. Do people feel protected and taken care of? Um, do they feel like the burden is, is, is evenly distributed? Do they feel like uh, the right people are making the right decisions, etc.? cetera? Um, one, one caveat about looking back is that uh, the models that we have in psychology and psychiatry about looking at those events on a personal level, and then we infer from that on, on a national level, uh, is is the the syndrome known as post traumatic stress disorder, but um, that that uh, syndrome implies that there has been a trauma and now it's over, and um, we keep we keep returning back to to what what has been traumatized, um, what what happened to us before, and I think the difference here, and I think you feel it in the states as well, is that this is not post trauma, this is trauma. We're still in it, and and we're not. It's not like the World War II, if you will, of the Vietnam War was was traumatic, but now the war is over, and some people, um, most people, just carry on, and then there's a group of people who keep on going back. I think that um, here we're still in the midst of it, and it's going to take quite some time um, until it's over. 
as Dan said, you know, the, the ramifications are, are, are everywhere from, from advanced technology, like, you know, the, the um, software that we're using to, to make, to make this, this very conference possible um, and their distribution, um, you know, to, to uh, the rise of, of uh, you know, food, uh, you know, food delivery all over from, from restaurants that can't be opened. Um, all the way to scientific discoveries, um, transportation, you name it. Uh, the economy, of course, and what it did to people. So I, I think I'd like to concentrate uh, on, on the, it's, it's still broad as it is, uh, the psychology of what, what has been going on. And I would agree with Dan that a very critical issue is the issue of trust. And I will also add to it the issue of fear. Um, I think that with the rationale that here um, 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 lack of adherence to, to the social distancing regulations by even a small minority of the population could, could um, set, set off um, you know, a chain reaction and, and prevent adequate control of, of um, the pandemic. Uh, I think that we've been systematically and persistently frightened um, by, by ominous um, um, ominous, uh, you know, statements by politicians, by uh, officials, um, not so much, I have to say, by practicing physicians, but, but people who have been officials in the Ministry of Health uh, here. And I think in the States, too, um, the, the, the um, music from, from the White House came, uh, went from, from absolute lackadaisical, you know, there's nothing in it, it's just a little bit of flu, you know, what's the big deal? To we're in this national crisis. It's terrible. I don't know how to stop it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that there's an upside and a downside to scaring people so much. I sure, think and, the and there was definitely a lot of criticism where that came from. Now you mention fear, and fear being enhanced when there's something unexpected, like the pandemic that we're experiencing still. Uh, Dana Rieli, in one of your webinars, you said that every time we experience something and don't encounter a negative outcome, then we're getting the wrong impression that it's safer than what we thought it was, which kind of pertains to what Yoram was yeah. saying. So I'm guessing you were, of course, referring to the pandemic. And do you think this is a, a human trait or is this something we can somehow maneuver? Yeah, so um, uh, both. Uh, before I move to, to your question, I want to add one small thing to Yoram. Um, it turns out that uh, people have a tremendous amount of resilience. Um, but one of the things that helps with resilience is know what, knowing what is going to happen, right? If, if you tell me you're going to get a shock and then you might get fired and then there'll be three weeks and we have a plan, we can suffer the pain. Not knowing... Uh, creates what we call learned helplessness, makes, makes things very, very hard to control. And, and again, it's not about the absolute level of pain. It's about not knowing where bad things are happening. And that's really, really tough. If you walk around the world and bad things are happening to you without you knowing, <laughs> that's a, a very, very tough. It's also not knowing or are you talking about information not being properly conveyed or maybe both? Not expecting, I would say not expecting, not, not anticipating, you know. Yeah, and it could come from we don't really know and it could come because of no, uh, not being conveyed. So if I, I tell you, Michal, I'll tell you tomorrow what the plan is. And tomorrow I say, I'll tell you tomorrow what it is. That's very different than say, I have a plan for the next two weeks. We might change it, but, but here is how it's going. So um, the, 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 there are different types of stress. By the way, this kind of stress that not knowing uh, also has a bad effect on the immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so that, that's, that's one thing. So it's, it's, it's stress and fear and, and trauma. And the, the, the not knowing where it's coming from is, is adding to that. Now, in terms of your, your question, um, kind of... One, the, one of the ways that uh, we learn is by experience and not from description. Yeah, there's an amazing uh, amount of work on this by Ido Erev, a professor in the Technion. And um, think about something like texting and driving, if you remember the old days. <laughs> um, the, the, when you text and drive, let's say you think the probability of texting and driving and something bad happened is 1%. So one day you do it, and nothing bad happened, the probability is 1%. 
in your mind, you change the probability. You say, oh, nothing happened. Maybe it's three quarters of a percent. And then you do it again and again and again. Low probability events, when we engage in them, we learn the wrong lesson. Now, what's happening with COVID-19? <laughs> um, if you think about period one, closure, high level of fear, and a certain level of risk, but the fear is higher than the risk. And then the disease is going down. And some people would adjust and some people would stay. But the fear will, will the question is what will get the fear to go down as well? And the same thing we, we mentioned with the feedback from texting and driving is going to help here. So imagine two people. Imagine one person who says, okay, they'll tell us that we can go out, but I'm going to wait another month. Versus imagine another person that says, I'm going to go out just a little bit. The, the person that will go out a little bit would go out, nothing bad will happen to them. The probability is very low in a second period. Odds are that nothing bad will happen. And they'll say, no, it's not so bad. So for example, my, my research lab at Duke, uh, my plan is uh, to ask people um, to show back up to work, but even for one hour a day. Like you could say, oh, let's let people stay at home if they're stressed. But that stress will not go down. But then so the question I, is, how do you maintain the same behavior? The let, lower the stress, but maintain the responsible behavior. Yeah, and and that needs to to come from from uh, social cohesion and caring about others. You know, so for example, um, we still have a tremendous stress, a, a pressure um, to to shake people's hands. Like if we met, and I would come to you with my hand out. Uh, you would have a very hard time <laughs> not shaking my hand, right? You could, you could, you could put, give me an elbow. Like the elbow is helpful because you show an action, but otherwise, if you did that, please don't. It it would be really tough, right? It's it's mm -hmm. it's so aggressive. If I came for a hug, actually, we should <laughs> uh, do some experiments on this and see how how people react. But I think that keeping it, we need experience and we need to create a new a new norm for, uh, for, for, for a while. Um, we need to do reminders about uh, washing hands. Uh, we, need, we need all kinds of, all kinds of tricks, um, but we do need them. The reality is that in Israel right now, numbers are very low, distancing, mask, washing hands, uh, we're, it looks like uh, we're fine, right? But of course, uh, and no, no, large, no large gatherings, that's a, that's a dangerous thing. But, but if we want society to come back to normal, we have, we have to go out. Now, uh, one other point is that uh, one of the things that we're recommending now to uh, city, uh, cities around Israel is to create uh, institutions for this Corona period two, we call it. Corona period one, we were locked. Corona period two, we're trying to get out. So what are the odds that I will go right now to a very busy coffee shop or restaurant? Very, very low. So we're asking mayors uh, to allow restaurant to expand from the restaurant to the sidewalk and even to take a few parking spots. Because if the distance is very high, there's a chance people would sit. Big distance. But if they'll do it two or three times for two or three weeks, then we could you know, go back from the sidewalk into it. We need the experience that would teach us that things are safe. And for um, some things, it would be easier like supermarkets and coffee shops, for some things like movie theaters, it's going to be much more, much more complex. Although you are seeing at least, I know here at Central Park, people aren't maintaining social distancing and it's not scaring people away. There are certain parks that have kind of uh, created different pods for people to know where they can sit and where is safe and to utilize the space. But it's interesting that you, you're actually looking at people's fears rather than the limitations that need to be at hand. Um, but Yoram, I, I saw an interview of yours uh, on, on Channel 12 where you're talking about people's stress level and how pretty much people, people have had many, many questions and understanding the stress is kind of the first way to deal with it. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that, but also tell us how come in Israel, where things are starting to open up, it seems like a lot of people very quickly forgot that COVID even happened. Like, is this our mind playing tricks on us? 
Yeah, it's it's a tough one. I think there there are two issues here. I think one is the what what Dan has been talking about, which is how do you desensitize people um, um, to something that was very frightening beforehand? How do you get them to to go past their their anxieties about it? But the other one is is the issue of trust. Um, I would agree with Dan that the trust of the population here in the the authorities, in the Ministry of Health, uh, certainly, uh, has been violated. People feel like uh, they've been they've been scared that there were cries of wolf, wolf. You know, the the, the sky's falling, the sky's falling, um, and for for the vast majority of the people, nothing bad happened. And I think that there's a reaction to that. Once people feel like they've been fooled or they've been frightened by something that really isn't so scary, or even worse, if, if they suspect an ulterior motive, you know, to, to, to those uh, scares, then they're going to rebound. Then they're, they're going to they'll say, oh, yeah, well, let's, let's do that. Um, I also think that the, the uh, forces that draw us together, like shaking hands, like hugging, like... Uh, gathering together, you know, congregations congregates, congregate, and, and societies socialize. Um, um, you know, people get together. That's that's what we're about. We're, we're strongly wired to do that. So I think the prohibitions against that would 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 be temporary. Um, and again, I think it's it's very much an issue of people following um, um, instructions if they feel like the norms are just that that. Um, um, uh, the the, the uh, instructions have, have been rational, and I think the issue of trust is 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 really paramount there because um, I'll, I'll give an example from from something that anyone who's a practitioner or a clinician doesn't like. You know, the issue of malpractice. When do people sue their their care caregivers, their caretakers? It's not when they've made a mistake. You know, I think people can be very forgiving if they feel like their doctor has made a mistake. But the doctor did their best, and at the time they made the, the right decisions, you know, what would appear to be the right decisions, but there was a bad outcome, or even that the doctor tried very hard, that they did their best, you know, people would tend to be very forgiving. The, the, the point where people sue their caregivers is when they feel like the doctor's been negligent, or worse, you know, arrogant, or, or um, you know, dismissing some, some concerns that, that were raised. That's when they get vindictive. There's also there's also some results. There's also some result to support your own statement that uh, when physicians apologize for the mistakes, uh, lawsuits go down. And it's kind of interesting because lawyers never want the doctor to admit, right? Yeah. Let's say a, a physician made a mistake. The lawyer say never admit the mistake. It's bad for court. Yes, but it has a higher probability of of not not getting there. I think that uh, pertains to many different industries. Oh, Take yeah, those. yeah. And, and, you know, for those of us who are old enough to remember um, love story, you know, love means never having to say you're sorry. Well, unfortunately, politics means never having to say you're sorry. And that's not good. That, that does not foster trust. And I think that's something else that goes, goes here. Um, I, but, but talking about fear, I think something else that happened, and it happened here in Israel, it, it doesn't affect everybody the same way. There's this, this old um, um, law in, in uh, individual psychology uh, called the Yerkes Dodson Law. Uh, that's really more than a century old. There are two, two American uh, psychologists who quantified it. That if you want to improve people's performance in most many things, you know, if you increase the amount of stress you put on them, you get, get a performance. Uh, this is why we have, uh, for example, exams in the university, because if we would tell the students, you know, this is really important, but we know you're adults and you want to do a good job. So we're sure you're going to study this. And before we go on, you know, that'll be the end of it, you know? So, so likewise with the, the police and, and, and enforcing tra traffic uh, regulations. So people have to be stressed to, to a certain degree in order to, to improve their, their um, um, performance. However, once you increase the stress behind, beyond a certain point, performance is going to go down. People are going to get overwhelmed. People are going to get traumatized you know, from the fright or flight. You're going to move on to freeze, which is not good. Um, and I think that because the, the point where that happens, where, where people start panicking, um, is different for different individuals. That point is not uniform for the whole population. What would only get some people to, to start 
uh, complying with, with, with the party line, you know, might get others to really panic. And I think looking back, at least here in Israel, I think that the system made the mistake of scaring people too much and thereby bringing on two types of, of responses. One of which we've, we've discussed here, and that is that people are so frightened that it's very hard to get them out of their holes once the, the bulk of the danger has, has, has uh, uh, gone down. But the other is that people um, uh, just become reckless and careless. And because of the, the reasons that Dan mentioned, you know, they say, well, you know, nothing happened. They're, these guys are just, you know, putzing around with our minds and, and who cares, you know, and they, and they move on. You're, you're both really stressing the issue of trust yep. and uh, the information that was conveyed, maybe mixed messaging initially being a little too lax and then really scaring the population. How concerned are you both seeing that experts are talking about a second wave that could be worse? What, you know, from a professional standpoint, what can be done? Because to me, it's very startling to hear you say this. Well, you know, so, it's, it, it's uh, tough. Uh, you know, there, there's there's a very important issue here that we haven't raised before that that I'd like to to um, um, raise our attention to, and this is the following: we've only been talking about the COVID nineteen crisis and casualties who die from from um, uh, you know the the uh, the, the illness the, the uh, SARS virus. And I think once you do that, and I think we've all done it throughout the world, you know, and you in, in the media really were, were um, conveying that, you know, once you do that, you get into tunnel vision. You only look at what happens with COVID and you only measure the, the casualties of the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. And when you do that, you miss the whole picture. And I think this is, this is my impression that, and this is on a worldwide level for reasons that could be understood. By focusing so much on, on what's happening with COVID and stopping COVID, I think we've done a bad job in addressing many other ailments uh, in society, some of which are ongoing, you know, for example, the, the economic situation, and some of which are really the direct consequences of, of the, the um, uh, precautions and, and the steps we've been taking to protect us from, from uh, uh, Corona. And, and those are things like hospitals not functioning properly because they were silenced. And uh, right now, economy not recovering back. And I would say that if we don't only uh, count the number of people who've died from, from um, Corona, we might see that casualties about other things have gone way up because of stress, because of undiagnosed malignancies, because of... Uh, unbalanced uh, diabetes in, in, in many people who did not show up to get their periodic tests or to renew the prescriptions. And I really hope that by the next wave, you know, people are going to understand that the job, the job of, of COVID specialists is to decrease uh, and, and, and control pandemics. And that's what they're good at doing. And that's what they're being paid to do. But that's not the whole picture. And I really hope when the next wave hits, that the people who are in, in, in decision making, um, um, who have the decision making powers, would, would be brave enough and, and honest enough to say, you know, this is terrible and the danger is not completely over. However, we're going to have to sustain some kind of, of, of damage, you know, in order not to shut down the economy and bring all this collateral damage that we have. Sure, which um, again comes back to trust. And we also saw here absolutely, in the States, people and, not going, people stop taking, uh, you know, or, or making regular visits or going to the doctor for other medical conditions. And yeah. that had devastating results. Yeah, and there, Ben is absolutely right that, that trust is, is key because if what was permissible, what was really understandable, you know, during the first step when we really didn't know what, what the pandemic might do. I think that fears of the Spanish influenza have, have been greatly exaggerated. But, but you know, that's, that's uh, perfect hindsight. But now we do know, we do know how bad it can get. And so I think the second time around, if people say, look, we might have, uh, we, we did overestimate it the first time around. We really didn't know. Now we think it's safe enough for you to do this and that. And we might sustain some casualties, but I really, we really think that the uh, um, costs outweigh the benefits. I think people sure. will be more understanding. Handling and of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
uh, what, what I think what, what you're asking is really about a very interesting paradoxical result. So you say we were in a lockdown, Israel, in reducing the amount of people who got sick and, and passed away. But the experience of people is that this is not a big deal. So paradoxically, like if we were less successful and more people got sick and more people got uh, uh, passed away, then for the next uh, wave, if there will be one, people would be more prepared uh, to, to take personal costs, stay at home and so on. But paradoxically, and this is going back to the notion that we talked about experience, because the, the probability of getting sick in Israel and the probability of, of dying in Israel was so low, the experience of people is this is not such a bad deal. So I think we're going to enter, if there will be a, a, next, a next wave, with feeling of no, I, we, we know Corona. It was here before and nothing bad happened. Now, nothing yeah. bad happened partially because we were such in quarantine. But that's not how people are going to interpret it. People are going to interpret it. I've been in this for three months. It's really not a big deal. So, so there, is, there is a risk, again, like texting and driving and other things, that the <laughs> strong measures in phase one, the relative success is teaching people the wrong lesson for, for wave two. And, and that means that wave two, I think, will be much harder to mobilize people in the right way. We, because instead of having the, the Spanish flu in the, the back of our mind as the fear, we'll have these personal experience of three months when nothing bad happened and now we'll have a hard time, really hard time getting uh, you know, uh, young professionals in Tel Aviv when they, they saw nothing negative. Uh, and of course, basic. without the trust, why should they listen once again to the government? We're sh very short on time, but I would love to hear some advice, some tips, and on a positive note, we are expecting another wave. Um, people are stressed. People are going to remain stressed. And this is something, you know, modern society brings with it regardless, and COVID has made it go up the roof. Uh, Dan, let's start with you. Some tips. How can we maintain, sustain some form of men good mental health and mental standing? Okay, so, so I think this is going to be with us for a while, right? Uh, second wave, no second wave. This is with us for a while. There's, there's going to be a new, a new normal. And if we talk about kind of one of the underlying things as being stress and inability to control, I think we need to bring some control into our lives. Uh, one form of control is called shopping therapy. I'm not recommending it, but it's one way, right? And, and the reason shopping therapy is a sense of control is you take your credit card, you do something, you change the state of the world. Expensive, uh, but that's, that's one way. Another way to gain control is in small things, right? It's true that we can't get all of the control and we can't get everything back, but we need to get some control. So, for example, push-ups are very good. Uh, my, my hands are badly injured. I can't do push-ups, but... Uh, stomach crunches. And, and the reason I recommend that rather than walking, for example, is that walking, you can't really see an improvement. But, but if you do push-ups or something like this, every few days you can, you can feel that you're doing one more, or if you do meditation. So take something that you could see visible improvement happening on a relatively uh, quick, uh, quick basis and, and do that. And then Yora mentioned uh, our social nature. We're social creatures. What, what is so unique and amazing about us is that uh, we have the capacity to care about the people. Uh, we have the capacity for collective action, for altruism, and so on. And I think this period of, of uh, Zoom meetings is, is taking away uh, some of that. And, and I think we need to figure out how do we maintain social relationship? Uh, how do we do uh, things for other people? Uh, I'll just tell you that, that for me, um, you know, most of the day I sit in front of this laptop uh, in meetings. Uh, when I want to have a social meeting, I do it on my iPhone or, or an <laughs> iPad. I, I move <laughs> to a different corner in the house and I do it slightly different. I, I'm basically kind of using signals to myself that says, this is not work. Now, it's this corner of the table that is social time. <laughs> this corner, slightly different device. But we need to, to realize that Social relationship uh, fuel us, and 
uh, give us hope and uh, give us a sense of connection. They give us resilience. Yoram, how, how do we get over this, uh, this physical divide to create that social feeling? And is that really what we need most during a time yeah, like this? Absolutely, we do. That's, that's one other thing with which I agree with Dan. Um, I, I think that we're totally dependent on, on our social networks. And I think sustaining them, maintaining them, keeping them alive, uh, keeping the flow of, of good vibes and even bad vibes moving back and forth, I think that's absolutely essential. And I think that's been one of the upsides of this happening now. You know, during the Spanish flu, people could only send letters to each other that would arrive three weeks later. So I think from that perspective, we're in a much better, we're in a much better place. Um, and frankly, I've been sitting here and I've been agreeing with everything that Dan said. So I'm glad that there's one single thing that we don't completely agree on. Um, I do agree. I think it's absolutely essential to engage in physical activity. And I think that's it, because the, the pandemic has enforced us uh, passivity. And, and passivity is the root of all evil. People get traumatized. We know that uh, the, the chances of soldiers to sustain PTSD are directly and strongly proportional to the degree to which they feel helpless to change the situation around them. And I think that key to that, and because experiencing is much more important than what you know cognitively, I think that not being locked down in one place is so important. So my advice would be, you know, during the next round, get out of the house. You know, people don't get uh, uh, the virus just because it's flowing in the wind. People get the virus from being close to other people. So things that you can do, physical activity that you can do out there, you know, go, go walking, go running, keeps you on your feet and we need to move. Um, um, and I think that in many countries, in Israel too, they, they, the authorities realized that and made uh, the, the appropriate exceptions in the scare tactics. They said, well, if you're go going to do exercise, you know, do that. And I think that's one thing that's extremely important. And it's also important because sitting down at home makes us gain weight. The average is really gained two kilograms during this, this you know, four pounds. Uh, during we this know. Time. You got to shed them. So I would I would say from earlier on to keep people moving. It's it's incredibly important. It's also an antidepressant. You know, thirty five minutes of of, of uh, intense uh, aerobic exercise is equivalent to to taking an SSRI in terms of prevention and treatment of depression. So I would I would stress that, and I would stress, as Dan said, the social relationships. It's 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 the end all be all. You know. So of, to conclude. We have to not be passive, uh, physical activity, shopping. <laughs> I definitely wrote that down. Oh, no, I wrote that down. Shopping makes you feel better because it gives you control. I'm okay with that. <laughs> and, uh, and social interaction and to try to find a divide between your work life and your social life, even when we can't actually see each other in person. Gentlemen, this has been such a pleasure and I have so many more questions, but we're out of time. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank really you. such a treat. Thank Definitely. you very much. You too. And, and hang in there and hang in there. Thank you so much for being with us today. Of course.